Uh, oh. Just so everybody knows, just to introduce him real quick before Bible class, this is uh, Andrew Gass. Uh, he's preaching in Columbus, Texas right now. Uh, he's here with us this morning to bring us our Bible class, and he'll be here to preach. He's one of the men uh, interested in the work uh, with us here uh, after Tyler moved on to San Antonio. So give him your undivided attention. We appreciate him and Rachel and his family being here with us this morning. Well, good morning. Good to have everyone out this morning. Good to uh, have even on a, uh, a little bit of a sleep-deprived schedule, a little bit of the uh, everybody's favorite day of the year where we get to lose an hour. And uh, I think I, I was, we were, got the opportunity to have dinner with the elders and their wives last night. We all agree that that should be the most bipartisan position in all of America is stop the time changes. I don't care which way we go with it. Just stop the change. And so, but in spite of that, it is good to be here. Um, my whole family is here. We're so excited to be here. That's my wife, Rachel. Our kids are uh, thoroughly enjoying your Bible classes already. We've been so grateful for your hospitality. We'll say a little bit more about uh, our story and where we came from in the, in the regular worship hour, but we're so glad to be here. We're so glad to have the opportunity uh, to learn about Jesus, to learn about the Word, to learn about what it means to be His people. And so we got the opportunity. Um, I sent out kind of just a, a questionnaire. I'm just going to be very honest. If we don't get through all of that, that's A-OK. -okay. Um, I've, uh, I've got a policy of uh, I'd much rather have us get through a very little amount of material with a lot of good discussion than try to force through getting a bunch of stuff. And so this is really just kind of a guide for us. And really, it's, a, it's an opportunity for us to talk about the God that we love, the God that we serve. And so today, we're going to be simply looking at a passage that is, is critically important in the story of the Bible. And so Exodus 34, verse 6 through 7, is one of the most quoted verses within the biblical text. And so all throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament as well, writers are constantly referring back to these verses. Because these verses are where God describes his own character. And obviously that is rich and fertile ground for the biblical writers to make their cases of how we as God's people should act, about why we can trust in the God that we serve. And ultimately in the New Testament, they will use this to talk about who Jesus the Messiah is. And so we want to know these things. We want to talk about these verses and see how our God describes himself. Because that is the God that we worship, the God that we love, and the God that we serve. And so very simply, before we dive too much into the actual verses itself, let's talk a little bit about the context. The only way we understand a biblical text is understanding how it's been set up, how it's been uh, led to in the story. And so tell me a little bit about Exodus 34. Where are we in the biblical story here? Moses and the Israelites mm -hmm. in the wilderness. Yeah, and so how have they gotten to the wilderness? They escaped Egypt. Yeah, so they, so they have been freed from Egyptian slavery. And so we got the whole, you know, kind, of, kind of the prologue of Genesis has led us to the family of Abraham. And in Exodus, we've gotten this massive nation that has been led out of Egyptian slavery by God. The strong right hand of the warrior God has led them out, and they are uh, freed from slavery. And now, not only has God saved them from that captivity, but now he wants to enter into a covenant relationship. And so how does God enter into this covenant relationship? With Israel. Yeah, so they come to a mountain. Anybody remember what's the mountain that they come to? Sinai. Mount Sinai. Remember, where did we see Mount Sinai at the very beginning of the book of Exodus? Anybody know? It was called a different name. Yeah, Mount Horeb is how it's, it's said in the biblical text, but there's other texts that say Mount Horeb and Mount Sinai, it's the same mountain, the mountain of the Lord. And so it's really been Moses has, has gone from Egypt to Mount Horeb, back to Egypt, and now back to Mount Sinai. And you get this, you get this beautiful uh, thematic return to the mountain of the Lord. And now it's not just Moses, but no, Moses and all his people are coming to see the Lord. And so we see the incredibly beautiful descriptions, but terrifying descriptions of Mount Sinai wreathed in cloud and flame and lightning and thunder and the very voice of the Lord booming from the mountain. And Israel says, that was really cool, but we can't do that anymore. Moses, go up on the mountain for us. Speak to the Lord for us. Hear what has to be said. And so Moses, after Israel has agreed to the covenant, he goes up, he goes to receive the law, he goes to receive the instructions for the tabernacle to the, the dwelling place that God is going to have amongst his people. He's not just saved a people, but he has saved a people so that he might be amongst them. 
But as Moses is learning about this incredible plan, as he's learning about the beautiful tabernacle that Israel is going to construct, what is Israel doing in chapter 32? Out comes this calf. That is one of the funniest lines in the Bible to me of Aaron. And we've, we've all had, especially if you have siblings, we've all heard siblings try to make that kind of excuse. How did this happen? It just, it just appeared, Moses. I threw gold in the fire and the calf just appeared. It's weird how such things happen. But as God is on the mountain speaking to Moses, saying incredible loving words about the relationship he wants with Israel, Israel's down at the foot of the mountain. They're like, we haven't seen Moses in a long time. Aaron, make us a God. Make us a God, and that will be the God that has led us out of Israel. And it's clear that Israel and Egyptian slavery has not just learned what it means to be slaves. They've learned what it means to be enslaved to the false gods. They've learned what it means to, to abandon the worship of the one true God. And so Moses and God are dealing with this problem. And, and what is the initial approach of God to this problem? He says, Moses, get out of my way. He says, it's time to, to start afresh. And could God have done that? Would, that? would that have been just for God to do? Yeah. The promises to Abraham could still flow through Moses. That's what God says. He says, Moses, I'll make you the new Abraham, and out of you a nation will flow. And think about how tempting that must have been for Moses. Moses, who has already had to deal with chapters of dealing with the people, who has no interest in his leadership who has no interest in following after him. They complain. They are, they are rebellious. They are groaning against him. They're constantly testing him and testing the Lord. And God says, Moses, if you, if you say so, we'll get rid of all those problems for you. We'll get rid of all those inconveniences for you. But how does Moses respond? He, he pleads with God. He intercedes with God. And, what, and let's go to this, because I think this is such an important text in, in Exodus 32. Because this, this whole conversation, and the reason I'm spending so much time here is that the conversation between God and Moses in Exodus 34 is a continuation of this conversation between God and Moses in Exodus 32. God is going to explain in Exodus 34 why he has done what he did in Exodus 32. And so in Exodus 32... In verse 11, after God has, has told Moses, get out of the way, I'm going to destroy Israel. He says in verse 10, let me alone that my anger may burn against them, that I may destroy them, and I will make of you a great nation. Then Moses entreated, he interceded to the Lord on behalf of Israel and said, Lord, why does your anger burn against your people, whom you have brought out from the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians speak? Saying, with evil intent, he brought them out to kill them in the mountains, to destroy them from the face of the earth. Turn from your burning anger and change your mind about doing harm to your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, Jacob, your servants to whom you swore by yourself and said to them, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven, and all this land of which I have spoken I will give to your descendants, and they shall inherit it forever. So the Lord changed his mind about the harm which he said he would do to his people. What, what is... What is the argument Moses makes on behalf of Israel? What does he say to God about why God should not do this? He doesn't say because Israel deserves mercy. He doesn't make an argument. In fact, he barely mentions Israel as a people. He's concerned about the glory of God. He's concerned about the witness that this would give to the other nations. He says, God, Egypt would think they had won. They would think you were not powerful enough to deliver them to the land that you had promised them. And in that capacity, they would, they would blaspheme your name. That's what David is told when the prophet comes to him and Nathan says, do you know what you've done? You have given cause in sinning with Bathsheba and killing Uriah the Hittite. You've given cause for the nations to blaspheme against God. It's not just that you did something wrong, but it's that it's been, you've besmirched the name of of the living God. And that carries weight to it. And Moses said, I, I, Lord, I want you to be honored. I want you to be upheld as the God that you really are. And so do this not because Israel is inherently good, not because Israel is, is so deserving of this, but because of your character, God. I make this appeal. And so it is that character then, that in Exodus 34, that God is going to talk to Moses about. And I think in large part we can read this section 
of 32 through 34 as, as God revealing himself to Moses. Then in the action of all this, and we can get into discussions of was God really going to do this or not, but I think that misses the point of this is God showing Moses and consequently through the reading of the book of Exodus showing us who he is, what he values, what he prioritizes, how he engages with a rebellious people, with a rebellious humanity. And so in Exodus 34, after he has given the, the replacement tablets that Moses had broken, we come to then Exodus 34 and verse 6 through 7. We're going to read this real briefly, and then we're going to start talking about the content here. Exodus 34, and, and we'll actually say in verse 5, it says, The Lord descended in the cloud and stood there with him as he called upon the name of the Lord. We get that, that conversational language, that relational language, that the Lord is standing there with him. It's, it's, it's a literary language. There's no person standing there. But God is with Moses. He is, he is present with Moses. And he says, Then the Lord passed by in front of him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth, who keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin, that he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished, visiting the iniquity of fathers on the children and on the grandchildren to the third and fourth generation. There's a lot to unpack there. And again, if we don't get through all of it, that's okay. We could spend years talking about this and seeing how this is borne out in the biblical story. But let's start, that I think, in an interesting note here. There's, there's, a, there's a name being pronounced twice here. Now, in our English translations, it, it says the Lord, the Lord. And do you notice something maybe different about that word Lord in your Bible? Yeah, so it's, it's in small capital letters, and so it's, it's, it's specifically designed to make you think there's something different about this word. Anybody happen to know what's going on with that? What is, what is the Lord here? What is that word? Yeah, so it's, it, it, yeah, it's the divine name. And so earlier in, in Exodus 3, when God is revealing himself to Moses, go ahead and turn back there, actually. We'll, we'll look to this and, and see the source here, keeping your tab on Exodus 34. In Exodus 3, and again, same mountain, same God, same Moses. We see the connections here. In Exodus 3, when Moses has been commissioned to go to Pharaoh and tell him to free my people, and that I will lead them back to this mountain to enter into a covenant relationship with me. Moses' first response is in, in verse 13. He says, Behold, I'm going to the sons of Israel, and I will say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. Now they may say to me, What is his name? What, what shall I say to them? God, God who, who's sending me? I, I think this is not just a question of Moses posing a hypothetical. I think Moses is asking a little bit here. God, who are you? I think he knows God. He recognizes God. But he's asking a deeper question. He's asking more than just, he's asking God, who are you? What does it mean to serve you? What does it mean to know you? And it says in verse 14 that God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, I am has sent me to you. God furthermore said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial name to all generations. The Lord says, This is how you know me. I am who I am. What, what is God saying? And there's, again, we could spend a long time on this. What is God saying about himself when he proclaims this name? Maternal. What else? Yeah, always exists. So con omnipresent is kind of the, the fancy word that we use for that. Eternal, omnipresent. What else? Holy. holy. Big word in the Pentateuch. Big word in these first five books. I am holy. I am distinct. I am separate. And yet I am all in all. I am holy. What else? Yeah, un yeah, uncreated. There, there, is no, there is no point where God was not. There it, I am. And you think about the power of that statement. Not I was, not I will, be, I 
am, past, future, and present, I am. You think about it a little bit too long, your head starts to hurt. But, and, and God, in, in conveying this, is trying to convey in human language something that human language cannot ascertain, something that is too big for human language. But think about also that, that God is saying not just these grandiose statements, but what else does he say about him? He says, I'm the God of your fathers, of your fathers, Moses. Not Pharaoh, but I'm the God of Israel. I'm the God of my covenant people. He is a God who is, who is grandiose and far beyond our scope and yet imminently close to us, imminently relational to his people. And that is the, the, the beautiful mystery of God is that he is far beyond our comprehension, and yet, as Paul says to the Athenians, he is not far from any of us. That is the, that is the divine name, Yahweh, as is often said. That is the name that is being said here. So why then might it be, if we flip back to Exodus 34, why is this name being said twice? What, what is the purpose of saying this name at the beginning of this and saying it twice, as it's said? Yeah, I think emphasis is a really big part of this, that this, this is emphasizing. It's almost like you're, he's getting Moses' attention. It's like, hey, what I'm about to say is important. There's no more important word God could say than God, than Yahweh. I am, I am the Lord, Adonai. He's saying, heed this, pay attention to this. Yes, ma'am. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I think hitting the nail on the head there that there's a it's a consistent theme in in the Hebrew literature that when, when you emphasize something, it, it, when you did it twice, when you said something, that was an assurance, particularly in this idea of a prophetic word. Well, th this is not somebody speaking for God. This is God speaking Himself, and He's essentially saying by His own name, this is the reality of who I am. This is. What you can trust on is that I am these attributes. Yes, sir. Is it possible that saying it twice, I mean, God the Father and then God the Trinity mm -hmm. are the same, but they're not? So I think one of the things, and I think that's a great question, because obviously, and we should, as Christians, we read the Old Testament in the light of Jesus, in the light of the revelations that have come in the life of Jesus. And so I think the answer to the question is really yes and no, because we always see the Trinity. We always see the, the presence of Jesus in the divine life. Now, was that what the original intent of, the, of, of Moses and the authors of Exodus and, and the early readers? They wouldn't have seen that, obviously, because they hadn't had that revealed to them. And so I think we, we have that, that duality of that, that the, in the original intention, I, I don't think that's, that's what's being revealed there. That wouldn't have made sense to any of the original readers. But through the revelation of Jesus, through the lens of Jesus, we can see that, yes, this divine name is not just who we consider to be God the Father, but God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. It's the same thing that we see in, in Genesis 1, 26, 27. In, again, in an original Israelite reading of when God says, let us create the heavens and the earth. They wouldn't read that as a trinity. They would read that as God in a throne speaking to his council, speaking to his, the people watching all of this going on, which in that case would be the angels, the divine beings. But we can read that as Christians and understand that, that the trinity is present in that, that all things were created through Christ, that it was the Holy Spirit hovering above the waters that is God creating through that. And so that absolutely, I think, is a valid principle of interpretation as Christians that we see the full life of God in these statements. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, absolutely. And John is doing that very intentionally in his gospel, that, that, they, that there is very clear Yahweh phrases, there's very clear Old Testament titles that are applied in the Old Testament exclusively to God. And yet Jesus is coming on and saying, no, no I, that's, that's who I am. Which again is, 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 the, is the mystery of Jesus Christ, that a man can say, I am who I am. 
And that's the, the incredible thing. That was the, the change that resulted in the person of Jesus, that suddenly the entire cosmos, the entire world, has changed because of the revelation of who Jesus has always been. Yes, sir. Andrew, the, uh, you alluded to it, but I just want to pull it out a little further. The, uh, the independence of God, he's standing on his own. You know, so many times he's been quoted in, in the name of God or, mm -hmm. or a prophesied speaking for him. He's now speaking for himself. You know? Yeah. And you kind of alluded to that, but I just kind of want to highlight that, the fact that here I am speaking for me. This is my word. I mean, this is not from some, not a prophetic or a, it's coming from somebody else. This is being independent. Mm hmm and, and exactly what's being highlighted, that's why this verse in particular was quoted so often. In fact, this is just a really cool analogy to look at. Go over to the book of Jonah real quick. Because this is, it's kind of, a, it's almost like a, a, an ironic twist of what's going on when Jonah quotes this. So we know the story of Jonah very well, but Jonah is, uh, I think we can safely say Jonah is probably not the best of the prophets, just in terms of, of, of attitude and, and, and uh, his interaction with even the people of Nineveh. Um, Jonah struggles. I mean, Jonah really struggles with the, with the burden of going and, and being the mouthpiece of God. And listen to why he gets so angry with God. If you look in Jonah chapter 4, after Nineveh has repented and after God has spared the city, we know the story that Jonah goes out and he goes and pouts, basically. And he sits there and it says he's going to wait for the city to be destroyed. He's like, I know these people. I know they're evil. Eventually they'll do wrong and I'm going to watch as they're destroyed. And so in verse 2, of chapter 4. It says that Jonah prayed to the Lord and says, Please, Lord, was not this, the, the repentance and the sparing, was not this what I said while I was still in my own country? Therefore, in order to forestall this, I fled to Tarshish. For I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, and one who relents concerning calamity. Therefore now, O oh Lord, please take my life from me, for death is better to me than life. Do you see Jonah's almost throwing Exodus 34 back in God's face? He's like, I knew who you were, because this is who you've always claimed to be. And you won't hate my enemies like I hate them. You won't hate the Assyrians like I hate the Assyrians. And Jonah, Jonah's like, I know you. I know that you're slow to anger and gracious and compassionate. And it's, and it's, it's because even, even a flawed failure of a prophet like Jonah knows one thing. He knows the character of God. He knows the mercy and compassion and the grace and the justice of the God he serves. I think it's one of the most brilliant usages of Exodus 34 in, in the entire Old Testament. But, but constantly the prophets and the writers are reflecting back on this. And they say, this is why we can have confidence in God. This is why we know God will bring judgment upon people as these phrases. Again, Jesus will reflect that this is the character that I possess. This was valuable to the believers of God because this was God, the pure, unfiltered word of God. Yes, sir. That's a really interesting point. I would like to go back a little to something you mm -hmm. said about Moses and God wanting to start over. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And he may have said, oh boy, here we start all over again. My kids are going to be the one he expects all this from. I mean, if anything would have taught him humility and compassion, it's the loser kids that he had. Absolutely. <laughs> Again, I can't help but make this, this parallel. Go over real quick. This is something that sometimes get, gets missed in translation. Go to the book of Judges real quick. I think this, this was pointed out to me um, probably a couple years back. And I, I, it was one of the most mind-blowing things I had read. And so at the, at the end of the book of Judges, in, uh, in Judges 18, So, anybody, Judges 18, not to spend too much time on this, but there's, there's a story that, that is used to highlight how far Israel has fallen away from the, the time of, of Joshua. And the story of Dan is, is the story of idolatry, the story of betrayal, of violence. It's a, it's a horrible story. That The only worst story is the one that comes right after it with the, the concubine of the Levite. But in verse 30, there's, there's this, this false priest that goes throughout the story of, of, 
uh, chapter 18. And it's a guy named Jonathan. And it says in verse 30 that the sons of Dan set up for themselves the graven image, this idol. And Jonathan, the son of Gershom, the son of Manasseh, he and his sons were priests to the tribes of the Danites until the day of the captivity of the land. Now it says Jonathan, the son of Gershom, the son of Manasseh. Does anybody have a little footnote on the name Manasseh there? What does it say? Some ancient versions read Moses. Yeah, so there's, there's, some, there's some textual variants, and they're the oldest ones, the Septuagint, the Vulgate, that read that as Moses. Well, we know Moses' son's name was Gershom. And, I th and there's, a, there's a principle in textual interpretation that the more difficult interpretation is most oftentimes the correct one. Because nobody would be like, oh, you know what would make the story really good is if we showed that Moses' family failed. But you could very easily see somebody being like, ah, that's going to be really awkward if we say that's Moses. Let's, let's, let's say it's Manasseh. We'll just kind of make it vague. I think, the, I think the Moses translation is correct here. And so exactly to what's being said, Moses' grandson is an idolatrous priest. He's, a, he's, he's literally a false priest of a graven image. And I think what, the point that's being made is exactly right. It, it wouldn't have been a better nation if it was Moses. Not that Moses was not an incredible, faithful leader of Israel. But the problem of, of Israel is the problem of humanity. And that's ultimately what Israel demonstrates for us, and it's, it's why Israel's story is told to us, is that it is our story. It is the story of a failed and broken humanity that is in desperate need of salvation, just as Israel needed salvation from the slavery of Egypt and the slavery of idolatry that plagued them for generations. We have need of freedom of slavery and freedom from the idolatry that has harmed us for generations. And so it was not about getting the, the perfect people. You were never going to make a perfect people. It was about God becoming a part of that people. About God redeeming humanity by taking humanity upon himself. That is the grand story of the Bible. It's not a perfect people being made but of an imperfect people being perfected through the truly human Jesus. And it is, it's why I, lo I love studying the Old Testament. Because in, to me, all of the New Testament is commentary upon the Old Testament story that is completed in the person of Jesus. And so all of this, and that's why, we, as I said earlier, you can see all of this in the light of Jesus. All of this is clarified and made sense by the person of Jesus. It is just incredible to see all of that. I'm rambling a little bit. Other thoughts and comments on, on this question. You can now see why I said we probably were not going to get through the whole sheet. Thoughts and comments. Yes, ma'am. Just in some of these chapters, before and after, too, it's just showing the hugeness of God. It's just huge. He's just huge. That's what impressed me about it. His, his divinity and just hugeness. And that's what, it's so interesting when we, again, kind of looking at a big picture of, of this passage, it's so amazing that right after Israel has rejected God wholeheartedly, like literally, as Moses is up there with the tablets, they're breaking the first commandments. They're, they're having a God before God. They're making a graven image. Like the, the very first rules are like, ah, whatever. I don't agree to that, but let's get rid of those. And, and, and you understand, you feel, Feel the pain of God in that, that he has saved this people, not because they were great, but because he loved them. He saved them from Egypt. He delivered them from something they could never deliver themselves. And immediately they turn around and they show how flawed and broken of humanity they have. And you can understand the anger. I, I get the anger. That makes sense. But it is the mercy and the compassion that is far beyond my ability to understand. That is the great mystery of God, is that he is so huge. He's so big. He's so good. And as David said, when I, when I consider you, God, what is man? What, what am I that you take notice of me? And yet you've made us just a little lower than the angels. That, that is, that is the, the, the thing that should drive us to our knees in praise. That God, you are so far beyond us. And yet you love us, not because we deserve it, not because we, we have earned that in some capacity, but because you are love. 
the overflowing love of, that God has within himself as the, as the Trinity, as the love between Father and Son and Spirit, that love overflows into us because nothing can contain the love of God. And that is the, the incredible thing of this story that it should just always be in our mind, that the scriptures, more than anything else, scream out that God is love. And it's a love beyond our capacity to understand. Excellent point. Other thoughts and comments? Yes, ma'am. Mm-hmm. He knew their generation. He knew what was coming. And if they didn't have respect in this aspect for what was going on, he knew Jesus was going to be the ultimate sacrifice. And if being all knowing, because we're not, mm-hmm. you know, it, 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 could, it, it was probably very hard to be all knowing and be merciful. It would be, it's beyond our. Yeah. And, uh, you know, to, to know that, God, that, that Jesus was going to be the ultimate sacrifice and then have no respect for God at this point, that it just shows his mercy. And, and that's the thing that, I, that is so incredible, when you, again, when you consider the, the character of God, the nature of God, as being one transcending time. He, he is not contained by time. He is, he is the source of time. And so when you, when you read these things, again, we, just because that's how our minds work, that's how humanity works, we see everything in a very literary, um, chronological sequence of this. And so we see everything getting worse and worse and worse and worse, and then, and then Jesus. But God, at, at the same time that he is seeing this people rebelling against him, he is on the cross. He is saving his people. And when Jesus says, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do. It is not a time-bound statement. It is the manifestation of the love of Christ for his people. For the, the, the people that he loved so much that he took on their weakness, he took on their humanity so that he might redeem it through his perfect love. That he might free us from the death that we had been enslaved to. Father, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. They're, they're children, God. In, I, I firmly believe there's a, I was reading an, an ancient theologian who talked about that, that, that Adam and Eve in the garden appear to be fully formed, but they also are very childlike. And I, and I think that is in, in such a way, it's part of the reason I think that God is so often called Father, is because he sees us as children. My children, you will see when they come stampeding out that door, are, just, are beautiful and wonderful, and they destroy everything they touch. They're just, it's, in, it's who they are. It's not, because they're, it's, not, it's not because they're just horrible, demented, little demonic children. It's because they're children. They don't know better. My, literally, the minute, I don't know if you saw it, but the minute we walked in the door, my, my two-year-old Ophelia walked in and grabbed one of those blue things and just went, rip, and just took it off. <laughs> it, was just, it was there. It was, whoop, it was going to be taken off. I, I firmly believe that's how God sees us, is these goofy little kids that just don't know better that are, we are just so helpless on our own. And yet, even in the midst of us messing stuff up, even in the midst of us just corrupting everything we touch, God loves us intensely. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. That is, and, and if, you were to, if you were to sum the character up that is seen in Exodus 34, 6 through 7, you were to sum up the character of God as seen in the person of Jesus, it is a love for a broken, childlike people who have to be saved from themselves and have to be saved from the dark powers that have enslaved us, the evil ones that have put us in to the bondage of sin and death. And that is the love of God made manifest, that he has freed all of us from Egypt, from Babylon, from the corruption that we were enslaved to. Other thoughts and comments? Yes, sir. pleading with God and making really good points, uh, you know, about why to save Israel and things like that. And just impressive, uh, the growth of, of Moses and his leadership there. Yeah, absolutely. Great point. And I think that is a huge part. I think I mentioned this. Somebody, somebody was talking to me about this last night. But I think you can, you can look at the story of Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy 
very much in the sense of the story of Moses. It's the story of Israel. It's very much the story of God. But there's a story of Moses becoming a leader, becoming an intercessor, which is a character, a type of who Jesus was going to be to a far greater extent. But it is, I think it's absolutely correct that Moses, the last time he was on this mountain and standing before God, he's like, I don't even want, to, I, Lord, they're not going to listen to me. I don't want any part of this. Go send somebody else. Send somebody who's better than I am. I, I'm not going to be able to do this. And now, through the Spirit, through the power of God, he has gained the courage and gained the love of God for this people. He has been transformed by coming in the presence of the Lord. And in that way, he is typological for us that we who have been on Mount Sinai with the Spirit of God, but now within us, now as the temples, now as the full image of what the tabernacle was, Emmanuel, God with us, we are transformed by that encounter. We are emboldened like Moses. We are given love like Moses for our people. That is the transformative power of God. And you absolutely see that change in Moses, that he has, again, not because Moses has particularly done a lot. It's not like Moses has changed much. It's that God has transformed Moses through his leadership and through his presence and through the love that God has shown Moses when Moses was not exactly doing what he was supposed to be doing. God had mercy upon him, and that mercy has transformed Moses into a person of compassion and mercy. Excellent point. Yes, ma'am. Mm-hmm. And in uh, Exodus 19, verse 5 and 6, it says, Now then, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be my own position among all the people, for the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the sons of Israel. So this is what God is giving them. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, and, and, and like I said, obviously we haven't gotten to get a ton into the, the individual attributes of this, but, but all of these things, again, they are part of one unchanging God. And the analogy that I heard that I thought was so potent and, and, and helped so much of this idea is that God and his, his holiness and his love is very much like the sun in a way. That the sun radiates heat and light, and from the appropriate place, that heat and light is life-sustaining. But if you get too close to that same sun, the intensity and the heat of that light is, is too much for mankind to bear. It is the same thing ultimately with, God, with God's love. That God's love, God's holiness, when we are in the proper place, and ultimately through Jesus we are able to draw closer and closer to that. But that same love, when it is rejected, when life is rejected in the form of God, there is no other source of life. There is no other source of that. And so when you reject the love of God, when you reject the covenant relationship, that same love is a purging fire. And so absolutely. Guys, thank you so much for this. Excellent class. Yes, ma'am. Great. Wonderful. I'm so excited we have five more minutes. That's good because I was really thinking, I was like, oh, man, I got more time. Wonderful. I'm still really glad we're having the class. But yeah. So I think that's such an important point that, that, that God's compassion and mercy and love, it does not diminish his justice. And again, that's a good thing because God's justice was what overthrew Egypt. God's love for his people is what caused him to cast down Pharaoh and his army in the Red Sea. It's what led God to rebuke and destroy the power of the Egyptian gods and the plagues. It is that same love that manifests itself in such mercy and grace and compassion that also manifests itself in the destruction of the evil powers. You, you can't, it, it's not separable. It's not like you can talk about, you know, this is how, this is God in one way and this is God. That 
is God is that his great love and his great holiness, it is what casts down wickedness and what casts down those who have rejected that life-giving relationship. And, it is, and again, it is, it is not something I think we, we shy away from. It's not something that we try to, try to blunt the reality of. It is all part of that one cohesive picture of God. Other thoughts and comments? All right, so again, I, I, we obviously do not have time to go through all of these attributes individually, but I do want to, to just briefly touch on, if you turn to the back page, that last context. We've talked about this a little bit, but just to, to, to bring us home on this, how is this, this statement, this character of God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness and truth, who keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin, yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished, visiting the iniquity of fathers, on the children, on the grandchildren, to the third and fourth generations. How do we see Jesus in this statement? How in Jesus do we see this statement personified? Yes, sir. Yeah, and that's, that's one of the big points that the Hebrew author brings out, is that, that through humanity, God became the perfect high priest. Jesus became that priest who could sympathize with us, who understood what it meant to be tempted, what it meant to, to experience humanity in all of its fullness. And so that, that humanity, it is the only way in which we can have confidence to go before the throne of God, is because we have an intercessor, a mediator, who knows our weakness, who knows our temptation, and has provided the path of victory over it. Excellent point. How else do we see Jesus in this? Yeah, so we have to be able to accept and reconcile and, and ponder and dwell on and meditate on that this, this God who is interacting with Moses is Jesus. And think just for a moment of another mountain in the New Testament where Moses is before the very living image of God, and he and Elijah are before Jesus in his transfigured state. How cool must that have been for Moses to see, oh, oh, this is where this was leading. This is where Sinai was leading. This is where my encounter with God was leading. You, you are the fulfillment of all that I struggled with. I can't imagine what Moses' heart must have, must have felt like on that mountain but it shows that Jesus has been a part of this from the very beginning, from before the very beginning. Just briefly, what does this say about the cross? What does it say about the empty tomb? What does it say about the ascension of our Lord to the throne? Mercy and compassion and grace, slow to anger, long-suffering, as Peter calls him not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to know. That is, that is the striving that Jesus went through, the suffering he went through out of the hope that all would turn to him, that the cross is the ultimate manifestation of this, of the grace and the mercy and the compassion and the loving kindness that God has. And the empty tomb is the ultimate manifestation of the exodus, of the freedom that God brings his people, now no longer a physical nation overthrown, but a nation of death and a nation of sin, that we would be led to be before our God. Thank you guys so much. Excellent conversation, excellent class. I appreciate it deeply.